Good morning, and welcome to Bethany Congregational Church. Psalm 100 says this, Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Brothers and sisters, we gather together this morning to worship the Lord. We welcome each one of you, um, especially those who may be visiting with us. We have a guest speaker, Tommy Joes, uh, and he has brought some visitors, and there are other visitors. So we welcome each and every one of you to this worship service. And to those who are uh, tuning in via Zoom and Facebook, we welcome you as well. Uh, some of the announcements in the life of our church, if you'll look at that third fold of the bulletin, um, we are still kind of being uh, a little bit cautious uh, with uh, COVID and flu and other viruses. And um, we also want to uh, highlight once again our Mochitsky on uh, March 2nd. There still are a few volunteer slots, so if anybody would like to volunteer, we'd appreciate that. And that sign-up sheet is available uh, during the coffee hour. Tone Chimes practice uh, today is at noon, and uh, you can see the various prayer requests. Are there any other uh, prayer requests or praise reports from the congregation this morning? Okay, I'd like to um, have uh, Tommy come up for just a minute and give a little bit about what uh, ministry he's doing. We are going to be collecting a missions march this morning, so we'd like to hear uh, what Tommy does. Welcome. Thanks, Derek. We go back a long way. We'll, sh we'll see that in the, uh, in the message. But I work for an organization called Epic Movement, which is the Asian American Ministry of Campus Crusade. And this year is actually my split year. My first 18 years, I was working with Asian American Christian Fellowship, the Campus Ministry of Gems, and I know a couple of y'all from that. And in the last 18 years, I've been working with Crew, and it's a very large organization, and trying to understand how to leverage that organization to reach the Asian American community nationally and sending internationally as well. So that's what I do. Right now, my title is partnering, uh, strategic partnering and development, which means nothing, it means everything at the same time. It means I can do almost anything I want to the organization. I used to be the director, but it puts me in a really fun place to, to be able to do missions and partner with different churches. So thanks, Derek. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tommy. Are there, is there anyone else who uh, has any sharing for this morning? If not, I'd like... Oh, hello, Tammy. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I just wanted to thank you all for, I wanted to thank Bethany and the members, and I was so proud to see that when I had my father's um, repast here, that everyone was so kind and so helpful. Even when we got here, the tables were set up and ready to go. I hadn't expected that, but I was so thankful that we got the assistance that we got, and everyone was kind, and I just want to tell you guys, I can show you better than I can tell you my faith, and you guys are showing me your faith better than we are telling people, and so they go together, right? Faith and works do go together in this time and need. So thank you, I love you guys, and God bless all of us. Thank you, Tammy. At this time, uh, we would like to take a uh, missions uh, collection for Tommy's uh, ministry. And so if the ushers can come forward.
If you will please join me in the congregational prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for uh, bringing us here to worship this day. And Lord, we just, we come and we worship and praise your name. Father, we thank you for bringing uh, Tommy to us today. And we ask that you would uh, just be with him in his ministry work. And we pray that you would bless his ministry and use it to uh, reach many for you, Lord. Father, we also lift up our uh, missionary, the Global School of Sports, uh, with uh, Russ and Alyssa Carmahone, and we pray that you would uh, just continue to guide and keep them in their uh, ministry through sports, Father, and uh, be with them personally as they experience health challenges. Father, we uh, lift up those on our prayer list, Father, those who need uh, your healing hand uh, for uh, and strength, Lord, for Bobby and Alyssa and Aaron, John Slagle, uh, Andrea, uh, Tsugumi's husband Rick and her friends Mike, Rick, and Father, especially Tammy, who's had a recurrence of cancer, Lord. Father, we lift up those who need uh, your strength, Lloyd, Henning and Barbara Fukuzawa and Marge Smith and Haru Sugino. And we also continue to lift up Maurice Chin and Jean Chin, Gordon's sister Nora, uh, Monique, Amina, Diana, Lily, and Father, uh, for uh, Tammy Roman's family and the Bryant family, as they continue to uh, mourn the passing of her father, Lord. And the others, Father, who've lost loved ones in recent months, we pray for your comfort and peace to surround them. Father, we, uh, today we lift up our tithes and offerings to you as an act of our worship. Father, you bless us with so much, and we give back just a portion, but Father, we ask that you would Bless our tithes and offerings and use it to your glory for your kingdom purposes. Father, not just here on Hope Avenue, but in Santa Barbara and around the world. And Father, we lift up our nation and we lift up our world to you. Lord, there's so many things going on um, here at home and abroad. Father, wars and conflicts. And, Father, we don't understand this sometimes, but, Father, we know that you are in our midst and you are sovereign. And so, Father, we just put our faith and trust in you and we ask that you would bring about peace, O oh Lord. Lord, we lift up this service of worship to you as, um, as we sing praises to you, as Tommy comes and brings your word to us father we just ask that um, you would be glorified today and we ask all these things in jesus name amen please stand as you are able and take a moment to greet uh, your neighbors as the worship team comes up Okay, let us uh, worship the Lord together. We're going to start uh, with 10,000 reasons. Let's bless the Lord. Let 
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending, ten thousand years and then forevermore, bless the Lord my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. I worship Your holy name. Lord, I worship Your holy name. And never once, never once did we ever walk alone because God is always with us. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step, you were with us kneeling on this battleground seeing just how much you've done knowing every victory was your part in us scars and struggles on the way but with joy our hearts can say yes our hearts can say never once did we ever walk 
on our own. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone, and never once did you leave us on our own. on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone, carried by your constant grace, held within your perfect peace, never once, no, we never walk alone, never once did we ever walk alone. praises. May our homes be filled with dancing. May our streets be filled with Justice bow to Jesus as the people turn and pray from the mountain to the valley. Hear our praises rise to you. before the cross. May your glory fill the whole earth as the water overseas from the mountain to the valley praises rise to you from the heavens to the nations hear our singing fill the earth from the mountains to the valley Praises rise. 
praises we shout our praises to you today and father we're reminded of your faithfulness to us that lord whatever life hands us even when we go through trials and tribulations lord that we never walk alone because you are with us and your love endures forever and we thank you for those promises that we can rest in them in jesus name we pray amen you may be seated Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 50, verses 19 to 21. Hear now the word of the Lord. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. So uh, this is going to be a fun message. My name is Tommy Joe, and again, I mentioned that I'm a, a minister with uh, Crew or Epic Movement specifically. And this is a little bit of a dangerous message because I'm in, I kind of in a little bit of, uh, of ability to eisegete iso something where I'm actually putting meaning into Scripture instead of drawing meaning out of Scripture. So bear with me because this is going to be kind of a, a long roundabout way till we get to the life of Joseph. But I think it's very significant that today is, uh, tomorrow is actually uh, celebrating 906, or commemorating, I should say, 9066 day, which is the day that President Roosevelt signed executive order to incarcerate unjustly over 125,000 Japanese Americans. So this church, being a traditional Japanese American church in its roots, has something to say about this and some of the exile and we'll talk about that in our message. So it's gonna be a little bit about me, it's gonna be about my families, how it, how it comes together, and how it actually kind of intersects with this church, and you'll see that in the message. But my family, uh, I am 
fourth generation Japanese American. I'm Yonsei, or Sansei and a half means third and a half. We really don't know. But my wife is a professor of nursing uh, at Long Beach State. She's the director of undergrad. My daughter is an actress, and she's, uh, she just finished a movie called No No Girl, if you've heard about that. That's a significant film about modern day incarceration. My son's a nurse. He uh, does pediatric oncology up in Stanford. But my name is kind of weird. Uh, my name has, uh, Fukui is pretty simple. It's really, but my, if you look at my last name, D-Y-O, what the heck, what is that? It's actually, we found some uh, hiragana charts that it actually says it's Joe, just like my kanji is. So it's like street or something like that. So my name is Joe, my last name. So I'm going to be talking about my mom and my dad's side and how they came to the United States. So just like every other person of origin in the United States, we've all come someplace. So my, my father's side, uh, my, excuse me, my mom's side came from Hiroshima. They went to Hawaii. And then my grandfather, that's pictured on the far left, he was actually born in, in uh, Maui in the 1800s. So we've been here a kind of a long time. Well, after Maui, actually, he was drafted out of Maui and served in World War I. And so he was a veteran of World War I. And you can see him with a bayonet, all kind of cool looking. And then after that, he actually started the American Legion post in L.A., and so American Legions is the group that, that's kind of a veterans association. So it's a very si significant patriotic uh, organization. Well, that's kind of, sounds like a lot of daddy mommy stories, but it's actually significant to the story that I'm trying to come across here. My, uh, my, this is the fun part. My grandfather helped start a Boy Scout troop uh, at a Buddhist church, at Koyasan Buddhist Church. And the troop was named... Oh, how did you know that, Pastor? Well, how interesting. Well, here's the funny part. That's, here's some funny arrows. Who's that guy? Did I get the right arrow? Yeah, that's my great-grandfather. And who's the other arrow? What's the next arrow? Your grandfather. That's my grandfather, Hitoshi Fukui, the veteran of World War I. And there's another guy in there. My, my grandfather, Louis Abe. So Louis Abe. I know another Louis Abe. Oh, well, he's not Lewis. He's Lewis Yi, but I know him. So it's very interesting that our families, Derek and our families, Pastor Derek and I, we actually hung out together. It's a very significant part of our history that we actually started the Boy Scout troop together. And I could give each of these slides, I can give an hour lecture on, and I do. So if you want to come to Little Tokyo, I can give you the tour. But each of these are very significant. Each of the people in the slide are significant. Now, this photo is very interesting because I kind of discovered this photo and was corrected on understanding what this photo was. This is my uncle, and he has this little patch. That's, that's the World Jamboree patch in 1935, which they didn't have because of a polio outbreak, so they had it in 1936, which is very significant because some scouts in there went on to, uh, in leadership, went on to serve in World War, World War II. That's a whole other lecture, but that's a very interesting piece of history. Um, my grandfather. My grandfather has a, a little more colorful story, shall I say. So my grandfather went from Sendai, Japan, to Chihuahua, Mexico, and he was actually a miner in Chihuahua, Mexico. So he looks all, you can go in the, there's a map picture, and then you'll see a flag of Japan. So Chihuahua is about, you know, I don't know how many miles down from El Paso. But my, all my, my, my dad and my aunts and uncles were actually born in El Paso, and they spoke Spanish, Japanese, and English. So I got none. I just got one. So I'm American. So again, they were minors. Uh, and then, you know, my, my grandfather uh, in the 1916s, being a businessman, would, uh, there's this guy named Pancho Villa. And a lot of people think Pancho Villa is like fictitious, but he's a real dude. After the border, after the revolution in Mexico, uh, four generals split up, Zapata, Carranza, uh, I forgot the other one, and Villa, the, the four generals that, that control, that, that control um, Mexico. Well, Pancho Villa, depends on who you ask, is either a villain or he's like Robin Hood. Okay, so it's a really sordid history of who he was. But he actually killed several hundred, no, several, uh, several dozen people in Mexico, and my grandfather was a witness to that. So my grandfather knew Pancho Villa because he used to ride on his hacienda, and my grandfather, being a businessman, would actually f uh, feed and water his troops because he didn't want to get the really short haircut, right? 
So my grandfather actually knew Pancho Villa. He was also a witness to the massacre in uh, San Isabel in early 19, uh, 1916. And then he went to report that activity to the U.S. government. And the next day, Pancho Villa actually rode into Columbus, New Mexico, killed 20 Americans. And that started this whole border war w against uh, the United States. By the way, that sounds like a bunch of loony stories. And we thought it was too. But it's all documented in some books that I have here. And I, didn't, I brought the books for a context about the incarceration story and about my story. And the reason why that's significant is that he was a patriot fighting for our country, but was also hired to assassinate Pancho Villa. He was hired by the U.S. government to assassinate Pancho Villa. Pretty crazy story, huh? And again, we thought this was a bunch of BS stories from Grandpa, but they're actually true. Now, how is this dealing with our story in, 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 in the Word of God today. We'll see. So anyway, my story, my, my grandfather is basically rags because he was a economic immigrant refugee from Japan in the turn of the, turn of the century, uh, went to Mexico, and he had rags. Then he actually accumulated quite a bit of wealth in Mexico uh, after the Pancho Villa incident. By the way, he didn't actually kill Pancho Villa. He poisoned him but and with his coffee, Pancho Villa took the coffee and had a really bad stomach ache, got sick, and he thought it was the water. Sorry, that was a bad joke. So you got to figure that one out. Um, but in 1926, um, my grandfather's mine, a silver mine, was capitalized at $250,000, which is about $4.4 million today. Not a bad deal for early, you know, early, Mexi early northern Mexico. Uh, he was doing really well. And then circa 1934, Mexico federalized all foreign assets and took all of his assets away. He lost everything. So he went from rags to riches to rags. And guess where he came? Isn't that weird? In 1937-ish, he actually was a truck farmer in Summerlin. His address is in Carpinteria, and so he's back here. So the Bethany... Abef, you know, Derek, think we're clashing here. It's, the stories are clashing right here. He actually went to, uh, my, my father, Ken, graduated Carpentry High School in 1938. And I got some great pictures of him. So uh, Santa Barbara State, he, went, he, he finished at Santa Barbara State Teachers College in 1942. And he was, after the war, uh, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, he was actually allowed to finish his degree. So here's a picture of my dad. Not goofy. You love the carp, the carp. Who went to, anybody went to carp high? Went. went to carp high? Yeah, there, there's some people in the community that went to carp high. Is that this, that, I hope it's the right logo, but you know, shortest dude. There's a couple Japanese people in the, in the picture. And then that's his picture, a little circle around him in 1938. So we know that he graduated. We actually got that from the yearbook. We actually got that from the, uh, we went to the library. So we found some history of him. Um, anyway, Rags to riches, to ra and they're finally going to make money. They're going to finally have a bumper crop of tomatoes to sell. December 7th, 1941. A day that will live in infamy, and it changed the course of Japanese Americans on the West Coast and changed the course of U.S. history, world history, forever. Japan declares war on the United States. Japanese were suspected of potentially being involved in espionage, and we didn't know what those people were doing. We don't speak their language. We don't understand their culture because we don't know what they're teaching in those, in those mosques. Oh, did I say mosques? I meant temples. We don't know what they're doing in there, so we need to be aware. I don't trust them, Japanese folks. So President Roosevelt, on the anniversary tomorrow, February 19th, 1942, signed Executive Order 9066. And if you're Japanese American, and if you're not, but if you hear that EO 9066, it means something to us. It's not just numbers like a zip code, but it means a very significant part of Jap the Japanese American story. And so, Again, I'm going from my, my macro, uh, micro family history. It collides in Santa Barbara, and then it gets pushed out into all the Japanese on the West Coast. 
9066 basically unjustly incarcerated 125,000 Japanese Americans only because of the origin of our country. Three quarters of the people who were incarcerated were American citizens, like my dad, like, like, like my, my, un my grandfather who was born in the United States, or born in, in, in a territory of the United States or territory of the US, and served in World War I. He was incarcerated. So there were no limits to how far this executive order went out. And if you are members of this church who are not Japanese, every Japanese American person here who's been here a few generations has a story to tell. And many of those stories cannot be told anymore because our parents have since passed. And it's us, it's us here that are responsible for telling these stories. Now, the pictures are triggering. If you see the, the stories of the incarceration of people being loaded on trains. Um, there's a, the picture here with people that have bags. You're only allowed to carry two bags, right? That's the limit. And there's a whole thing of what you can bring. And if you have two bags, that's all you can bring. If you have a child, you can only bring one bag. If you have two children, you better have some help. And that's all the, that was the reality, what was happening during the incarceration. Our, our ancestors were given a tag that tag had our, our family number on it. The family number corresponded to our luggage and to where we were supposed to report. This, this map shows basically there's a black line that is the exclusion zone. If you live in this zone, you, are forcibly, you have two options. Either you are forcibly removed from your home under, under martial order, martial law order, or you, are, um, you can voluntarily move uh, inland. Now, just a second on this slide. The government never took away our property. Did you know that? Now, some would argue differently. In some places, I should say, by and large, the US government did not take away Japanese American property. But it took the ability away for us to work, therefore pay the mortgages on the property. So most, most Japanese Americans, unless they had somebody to steward their land, lost everything. And my grandfather, um, on, my, on my dad's side, my mom's side, who's a Fukui, I don't know if you know the Southern California, uh, Southern California Fukui, they're a mortuary business. And they actually helped some, somebody actually took care of the property when they were gone. So um, there, are 20, uh, there are 10 camps called, managed by the WRA, uh, the War Relocation Authority, that was civilian, places like Manzanar. How many family members went to Manzanar in here? Raise your hand high. So I just want to have a congregation. Who, anybody, families went to Manzanar? How about uh, Granada? I heard some Granada. There's a Granada, Tule Lake, Tule Lake. How about Heart Mountain, Wyoming? Okay, Heart Mountain. I'm in Heart Mountain. Gila. I was. In, my family was in Heart Mountain, Gila, and just to name a few. There's just there's ten of those. And then my grandfather also got to go to someplace else, uh, which I don't know if I have a slide for. I keep on going. There's a picture of the barracks, the different living conditions. That's the. Uh, next slide is a famous picture of Manzanar uh, in the back with a flag and the dust. And the three boys, that photo was taken by uh, Ansel Adams. There was a question, 27 and 28, that questioned the loyalty of the United States uh, as a person in the camp. And the, the, the paraphrasing the question, 27 basically, will you serve in the, in the army or will you serve in the military no matter where called? Now they asked people 14 and above this and they asked men and women. 14 and above, I believe. Is that correct? I think that's correct. Or some, maybe 15 and above. But that's pretty young. Will you go anywhere? And these kind of, you're asking me as a woman if I'm going to go anywhere? And then you're going to ask me as a kid, am I going to, are you kidding me? How do I answer that? And if I'm old, you're going to send me to the front lines? Are you kidding me? Well, the, ex, the other question was actually more insidious. It was basically... Uh, do you renounce uh, your uh, loyalty to the emperor of Japan? It, it has some other stuff. Do you, you know, do you forswear your allegiance to the emperor of Japan? Do you swear allegiance to the United States? Now, how would you answer that? Well, I would have answered yes, because yeah, I, I force. Wait a minute. If I forswear loyalty to the emperor, that means 
Oh, did you have loyalty to the emperor at one time? So it was not a fair question, right? So people didn't know how to ask that question. And people, some people stood in defiance of those questions to say, I am not going to fight for this country if I'm incarcerated. And I found out just recently that my grandfather, documented in an FBI file right here, was indeed a no-no boy. Because he, gave, he was willing to risk his life for this country by an assassination attempt against Pancho Villa, which was top secret, top secret. And, um, and he was arguing against being drafted if you're imprisoned by your own country. And he was a very, very adamant no-no boy. Didn't realize it, but then that's why we know how he ended up in the other places called Lordsburg, New Mexico, and then Santa Fe, New Mexico, and then eventually to Crystal City. So that's a whole other lecture, but that talks about the different types of things in our, in our thing. So there's two questions of loyalty. Those two questions were very, very difficult. People who said, said yes, yes, most of them were volunteered for the army and were put into the 442nd, 100th, MIS, uh, 522, et cetera, et cetera. We'll explain a little bit about that in a second. People who defied and said no, no, were also serving our country in protest. And history is trying to examine the protesters and the people who stood against the government. And if you really think about it, well, if I think about it, would I have the fortitude to stand against my government in an unjust situation? And as believers, that's something we need to examine. At times, do you stand in defiance to your own country in the name of the gospel? That's a whole other message. I guess you got to invite me back. So is it yes, yes, or is it no, no? And it's something we need to grapple with as the church. Well, there was a chance to prove loyalty. Um, the 100th out of Hawaii came first. Called one, they called the 100th. The 522, which is the artillery unit. There's an engineering unit. You also have the, the 442. That's, the, um, that's a very significant piece of our history in the military intelligence service. Anybody serve, any family members here serve in any of those branches? Can you just raise your hand? Okay. Good. Thank you. So, congregation, just pay attention to that because those are the, they have stories to tell. And what happens is, you know, I was somebody, I, I don't have generational trauma. I'm all, I'm just, I'm a historian and a preacher. But every time I tell these stories, I cry. I well up. I get emotional. And I, and I kind of realized that I do, I actually do have generational trauma. I do carry this story in me, and I never thought I did. And as a church, we carry these stories. This one, oh, this photo, this, this will get me. This is the 100th going off to war. And the 100th, they all have their lays on. It's the only time they're allowed to wear something non-uniform. There's a huge poster of this in Hawaii, and I look at that, I just pause every time. Just amazing what the sacrifice of they did. Their motto was go for broke. And if you were to talk about English, what does that mean in English today? You know, it's a pigeon English. Go for broke, our equivalent would mean if you're playing poker, which I don't do, honest. No, like when you're playing Texas Hold'em, it's about going all in. When you're giving it your all. And that's what the motto of the 442 was. And I'm going to say it's the 100th 442. I'm going to mix those up. It moved back and forth, and what were the 100th and 442? So if I just say 442, that encompasses all of them. But I also try to say 100th and 442nd, because the 100th from Hawaii was first. The next slide is just pictures of them in the foxholes. Uh, this is Rudy Tokiwa, the next picture of him arresting or uh, capturing 14 Germans single-handedly in Italy. Uh, each of these stories, each of these frames, I can go on for you know a half an hour on each of these frames. So. Bear with me if I go long. I'm not going to take a half an hour. It's a great story, though. This story is another crazy story. This is after the battle. This is the rescue of the Lost Battalion. The Lost Battalion sacrificed, had, a, had 900 casualties to save 200 and 212 Texans. 900 casualties, both killed and wounded in action, 
to save 220 Texans. Dalquist wanted to give awards to the 442 because he thought it was such a great battle. He had all these, he ordered the 442 to stand, stand in formation for this award ceremony. He had all these medals, medals and goes, and obviously that's not true in the, how he's holding them, but the medals and goes, where is everybody? I gave you a direct order to fall in for this ceremony. Where is everybody? And the commanding officer said, sir, this is all we have. Proving their loyalty. It was also known as a Purple Heart Battalion. They would become to, uh, come to know the most highly decorated unit of its size and length of service in U.S. military history. 21 Medals of Honor. 52 Distinguished Service Crosses. 560 Silver Stars plus 28 Oak Leaf Clusters, which means they got another one. 4,000 bronze stars plus 1,200 oak leaf clusters that they got another one. Over 4,000 purple hearts. Their sacrifice would lead to our freedom. And that's a core gospel message, isn't it? In a driving rainstorm in Washington, D.C. on July, 5, uh, July 15, 1946, President Truman, can you imagine a president coming out in a driving rainstorm? Says, you have not only fought the enemy, but you fought prejudice and won. This day, this weekend, we are commemorating the Day of Remembrance. Executive Order 9066, February 19, 1942, caused the forced removal of 125,248 Japanese Americans. And we'll pause on this for a second. We have uh, consulted with the Japanese American National Museum on a previous exhibit called Sutra and the Bible. Sutra is the Buddhist text, and the Bible is the Christian text about their experience in, during World War II. And there's, a, there's a book there that talks about that. These are resources I, if you guys want to funnel through after the service. Um, but we are trying to figure out how many people were actually incarcerated, or forcibly removed, I should say. So some people were taken out of camp, our original, original numbers that we said, there are, there are 110,000 Japanese, right? That was our, that's true. There are 110,000 Japanese that were put into relocation camps. But there's another 10,000 that were put in places like the D Department of Justice camps or Tuna Canyon. But there's a other, whole bunch of other people that were forcibly removed from their home that weren't in camps, but were forcibly removed. So people from, for example, Idaho were forcibly removed from their homes, and they gave the vol they go, oh, would you like to work in the sugar beet fields? And so they were forcibly removed, but not put in camps. So we added these people all up together, and you have uh, 125,248. And that list is still growing. As people say, hey, my, my family was there. They're not listed in this book. And if you go to Janum right now, you can actually put a stamp uh, on a family member, and they can look that up. And if you do not have a family member, there are a lot of people in the book that don't have any relatives that are living. And what we want to do is to honor those people by a mark as well. That's an advertisement to go to Janum. I were there. Understand, 9066 was not out of military necessity. The Gaman were the, uh, the determination of innocent community that faithfully persevered. Their sacrifice led to our freedom. Now, we were remember, this is a Japanese church. I hesitate to use Japanese because mine doesn't really exist, except for the food. But there's a term called shigata ganai in Japanese, right? And that's a lot of, it can't be helped. It can't be helped. So shigata ganai can result in two types of responses. One is fatalism, where I give up. I ain't going to do anything. I can't do anything better. It sucks, it sucks. I give up. But the other part of it, it could be faithfulness. When we, when we remain steadfast and grow in spite of the circumstances, we make the best of a bad situation. And that's where we're going to look in the life of Joseph. And I'm going to go through 10 chapters in 10 minutes. You think I could do it? Think I could do it? Okay. Genesis 37. Actually, it's not quite 10. It feels like it, though. Eh, maybe it is 10. It's 13 chapters. Okay. He was 17 years old. Joseph was 17 years old. 
And when the story kind of starts, you know, he was the son of Jacob, the youngest kid, little, probably a little bratty, gave a little bad report to his brothers, how they were kind of sloughing off, and his brothers hated him. Okay, you guys, remember this, these, these, this, this is going to be a fast one. Then he has this dream. Joseph has this dream of these grain stalks. So if you can imagine, these grain stalks growing, and then one grows up, and, an, and, and another one grows up, and the, gra- the small grain stalk goes up, and the big grain stalks bow down. And who was that? That was his brothers bowing down to Joseph. And the brothers go, what? And they're, they're just angry. They are, yeah, they are angry. He had another one. He had another dream that the sun and the moon and 11 stars would bow down. And Jacob, his father, heard this. He goes, what? Are you talking about mom and dad and your brothers? How arrogant of you. So, I mean, Joseph was a smart, arrogant little, you know. So, so, they, so his brothers planned to kill Joseph. You guys remember the story now? Is it coming back? So J- Joke, the, the brothers are trying, uh, uh, planning to kill Joseph. Reuben interstates, don't kill Joseph. You know, our, our father will be heartbroken. He's a little bratty kid, but, but dad loves him. And so Reuben intercedes, and he, he wasn't killed. So what do they do? They throw him in a pit. You guys remember that? So before this, because Joseph was the youngest, like me, one of a bunch of brothers and sisters, uh, I didn't get the coat, but his father made this really unique coat that was filled probably with jewels and very, very weird. So he had this really nice suit. Uh, Joseph and his brothers threw him into the pit, and instead of killing him, they slaughtered an animal, rubbed it all over his shirt, and then told his father that, hey, Joseph got torn up by a wild animal. So Joseph thought, excuse me, Jacob thought Joseph was dead. Reuben was a little bit freaked out too. Well, while he was in the pit, Joseph's brothers sold him to the Midianites, who sold him to Potiphar, who was an officer of Pharaoh. Now, kind of parallel, he was unjustly thrown in that pit. Kind of how like, yeah, we were unjustly thrown into that pit. Joseph was a good-looking dude. He was seduced by Potiphar's wife. And I got to mention that. Potiphar, I mean, Joseph was not trying, you know, he was trying to stay away from Potiphar, because she, Potiphar's wife, because he knew she was a bad thing. But ultimately, he was caught alone. And he was given excuse, uh, he, has, he had no witnesses. So just a little bit of a warning for us. You know, we have to be in a place where we're out, a place of out without excuse. Okay. Um, he put into prison. In prison, he was in charge, put in charge of the prison. You guys remember that? And while in prison, he was interpreting dreams for people. And then eventually, hey, Pharaoh was having these weird dreams. Can you interpret for him? And he goes, okay, I'll, I'll interpret for Pharaoh. And Pharaoh had these dreams about these, you know, these cow, these weird cows. These seven, it just, was just bizarre. And Joseph goes, Oh, through the Lord, those seven cows are the seven healthy years of great harvest. And the other seven cows are seven years of famine. So what it did is that Pharaoh goes, oh my gosh. And so he began to, during the, lean, during the uh, harvest years, stored up a bunch of grain. And he was able to um, store enough grain to last throughout the famine. And then people around, uh, countries around uh, Egypt would start to buy grain from him because they were all starving. And then Egypt became the most wealthy country, uh, most probably wealthy kingdom in that area. Joseph's brothers go to Egypt to buy grain because they're broke. They ain't got no money. They got no food. Joseph tests, I'd say punks his brothers. Right? You remember that whole thing where he hides money and then he goes, where's your younger brother? I thought you, and he goes, it was, it's, it's a great story. It's a great soap opera. And, you know, he puts a, uh, uh, Pharaoh, uh, Joseph puts a silver, silver thing and goes, goes back, you're accused of stealing and it wasn't stealing. And it was really, it's actually very funny to read if you read it as a, comedi- a comic, comic. But Joseph ultimately provides for his brothers and community. Because of the faithfulness of Joseph, Pharaoh eventually invites Jacob, Jacob and his kingdom to Egypt. Isn't that a crazy story? So out of horrendousness, 
out of horrendous circumstances, unfair imprisonment, he rises to the top and is able to provide for a nation that was estranged from him. And he reconciled with his brothers. Um, his brothers were a little bit freaked out when, Joseph, when Jacob died because, oh, dad's dead. Is Joseph going to kill us too, right? Because they were worried about that. But again, this is where we get our passage that we read earlier. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. So why do we remember? Why is it so important to remember the deeds of Joseph? Why is it so important to remember 9066 and what happened to the Japanese Americans during World War II? Why is it so important? Exodus 1, 6 to 14, in a key verse, says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And what happened after that? Made his life hard and imprisoned him and enslaved them. So if we forget the deeds of our past, it's very easy to slip into another situation like 9066. Now again, I have to be very careful of proof texting, right? Or isogeny, putting meaning to scripture instead of drawing scripture out. And I take that as a criticism, but just to hear me out on this. We must remember that God's plans are hard to understand, but he is faithful to accomplish his purpose. In the midst of the stuff you're going through, it is sometimes even hard just to say Jesus. Frequently, it is through the detours into the unknown the painful situation that God sends us into mission. It makes no sense at the moment, but God will never leave us or forsake us. That might be us right now. Why is my daughter going through this? Why, did my, why is my spouse leaving me here? Why am I in financial ruin? I don't understand why I'm dealing with this. But those detours can sometimes lead us onto mission like it did Jacob and Joseph. God blesses our faithfulness even in bleak circumstances. That's Joseph. That's the Japanese American spirit in 1941-42 throughout the war. Remember 9066. Remember so we don't repeat mistakes from the past. Let's pray. Jesus, you are faithful and you hold us very closely to your heart, even though sometimes it makes no sense. Father, we celebrate our forefathers that have gone before us and their ability to overcome in the midst of impossible situations. And in the midst of that, through their faithfulness, you have blessed us. Father, in the midst of these storms, help us to understand that sometimes you call us into mission and service. We actually ask that you would bless this church in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Tommy, for uh, the, that, I think, a very timely message uh, as we remember uh, EO uh, 9066 tomorrow, the uh, <coughs> anniversary of that. If you would stand and join us for a closing hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let's sing of God's faithfulness together. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou
forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Lord unto me, summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings on mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great He's faithful. And now for our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, this week, and forevermore. Amen. Please join us in the fellowship hall for coffee.